I'm Arlene Westerhoff and I am excited today to introduce a new video series to you called Prophetic Perspectives, Vital Revelation for the Church in Our Times. Now with this series I had two things in mind. The first is to help everyone out there who's growing as a prophet just to get to know the stories behind some of the prophetic ministers that you see on podiums in conferences across the world. The second thing I had in mind with this series is with each person I interview, I am asking them, what is the single most important thing that you feel that God has to say to the church today? Today's interview with Stephen Springer is one that just warmed my heart. You can feel the love of God and the Holy Spirit is flowing right through this. Stephen is an apostle. He's a prophet. He's been anointed as an evangelist. Stephen came to Christ you know, from the world of modeling and Hollywood. And these days, God uses him to prophesy to work with governments and to world leaders together with his wonderful wife, Renee. So just be sure to watch and God bless you. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this interview. I hope you're doing well. And today I am delighted to have a good friend, but also a prophet, an apostle, an evangelist of the Lord with me. His name is Stephen Springer, and Stephen lives in Dallas, Texas. You can see the beautiful weather behind him in uh, the mirror. But Stephen and his wife, Renee, they are the founders and the leaders of Global Presence Ministries. They used to live in Madison, Wisconsin, but very recently they have moved to Dallas, Texas, because the Lord is doing amazing things and mm -hmm. they're following the spirit of the Lord where he leaves, leads. Now, Stephen has a really unique anointing. He has been ordained as an apostle, as a prophet, and as an evangelist. Stephen is a good friend. He's a member of the Apostolic Council of Prophetic Elders and, and the Apostolic Council, an Apostolic Prophetic Council led by Cindy Jacobs. And uh, Stephen is also just an all around good guy. And so Stephen, it is wonderful to have you. Welcome to this interview. Excellent. Thank you so much, Arlene. And it really is, it's exciting to, to be alive in such a time. And I just, uh, thanks for the opportunity to let me be part of your, uh, your show here today. And boy, like we know, God is up to all kinds of good. And we just need to keep our gaze fixed on him because the things that are about to unfold are, is going to catch the world by surprise. In fact, it's going to catch most of the church by surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Amen, Stephen. Hold that thought because we're absolutely wanting to hear you on that. But hey, Stephen, I'm just going to ask if you could just introduce uh, yourself a little bit of the journey that God has taken you on to discover your prophetic gifting, because today we're going to concentrate on the prophetic. And so how did that go with you? Well, you, you know, it's interesting because, you know, both myself and my wife, Renee, we didn't grow up in the church. So even the context for God and all that, we, we, were, we were headlong. We were in the modeling and acting industry. In fact, my wife, Renee, actually owned a, a modeling and talent agency actually for for 14 years, uh, and it was during the midst of that, actually, as we were really trying to just discover what was the meaning to life, because we'd been running hard after fame, hard after fortune, and realized that actually at the end of the day, the beginning of the day, and every moment in the day, it was empty and void. And so we were actually on this quest, both of us, in a way, apart from one another, yet we were both trying to just find some answers to what life was about. And it was in actually in the, the midst of that, Arlene, is when we discovered that um, God was real. And, and honestly, I was actually in Europe, uh, actually on a modeling contract. You know, I was in Barcelona, Spain, when one day when I was uh, done with castings, got done early that day, I thought, you know, I'm just going to go check out Barcelona while I'm here because I was only going to be there for a week. And then I was off to Madrid and just doing the kind of the tour with, with, the, with the modeling. And I remember one day I'd gone down to the, to the old part of town where Christopher Columbus would have got his orders to actually go explore the new land from the, the Queen of Spain. And then I remember turning down this one street and there was this large Catholic cathedral. And as I was walking down the other side of the street, I simply heard this voice, go inside the church. 
And so I just made my way across the road and kind of just admiring the architecture and the fact that the, the church itself was over a thousand years old, where in here in the United States, um, if something's 50 years old, we tear it down and build something new. So, I mean, the fact that even something was that old still standing <laughs> was a miracle in itself. I remember actually going inside and um, just kind of caught up as, I, as, as you know, too, many of the, the large cathedrals of, of, of that were at one time houses of worship have really now become more museum-like and just places where people come visit. It's still kind of a holy in, a, in its some sense, but I remember going in and just admiring just the, the paintings and all of the, just the architecture and, and just the, the depictions of Christ, the statues of him and his disciples. But there was this Catholic mass going on in one of the small side chapels. And there was the priest and I think probably five old ladies that were sitting up towards the front. So I just kind of snuck in the back and did my thing and kneeled down. And it was in the midst of that because, you know, honestly, Ar Arlene, I really was on a quest. I was really trying to find out what is life really about? Because, you know, we had been after all the other things and again, all of it, the drugs, the alcohol, whatever, it was all just so empty and void. And I remember as I was sitting in the back of that church and I'm just contemplating like, what is life about? Like, why am I here? All of a sudden, Jesus, who's hanging on, on the cross, all of a sudden he comes to life and he starts to talk to me. I'm literally having this, this encounter with Jesus who's hanging on the cross and yet he literally came to life and began to speak to me, began to speak to my heart. Like I'm like, part of me, I'm going, you know, okay, I didn't do any drugs at all today. So I know this is clearly not some high that I'm on, but the reality is that it was God speaking to that deep desire within my heart that, that he really did have a plan. He really did have a purpose. And the fact that he actually called me by name Wow. And I remember I just sat in the back of the church and wept and wept and wept and wept. And I knew that day that God was real. And I knew that God had something to do with what I was going to be stepping into for the rest of my life. And, you know, the cool thing is that halfway across the world, R Renee, you know, at that time we were dating, um, she's actually having people, a friend of ours in Hollywood got saved. There was other friends around us that ended up getting saved and receiving Christ. And they were actually just sharing the gospel uh, to her. And it was in that time, the same thing. Her heart was being awakened going, yeah, maybe God's real. And, and so even then, even just, uh, our, I would say our stories like that so often is that uh, I, God's very demonstrative with me. And yet he's got this real gentleness with Renee. And to me, I guess that's really the beauty of the way that God just approaches everybody is that he knows each one of us. He created us for a plan and a purpose. And uh, more than that, um, he, he, he calls us friends and uh, he loves us with an everlasting love. And, and that's what we encountered was the everlasting love of God. And it, it, it's just been a fun adventure ever since because we were running hard after the things of the world, hard after the things I was knee deep in the lake of fire when God just pulled me out of the muck of the mire and just set me upon the rock, his son, Jesus. And, and you know, when, when you talk about the prophetic, um, I, I didn't know any of the language or any of that that was, it wasn't the context, but... To me, I, I would say, honestly, Arlene, that even from a small child, I, I was always a dreamer and had this extraordinary imagination where just ideas and thoughts and dreams, I was always part of who I was. And, and some of that I actually accredit to even just some of uh, the cultural heritage and background that I come from. Yeah, um, tell us about that, Stephen, because yeah. that's pretty special too. Yeah I, yeah, I do. And I think, you know, honestly, people groups have anointings, you know, and so I'll say that, you know, I'll tell you what, what we do a, a bunch of work in Africa. And, and I'll tell you what, Africans have a praise, they can praise and they can break things open with praise. You know, there's something about the, the, the Celtic, which I, the Celtic Gaelic, I, I've got some of that, a good portion of that actually in my background, I say 50% of my bloodline actually comes from, from either Scotland or Ireland. And and then, and then I also have Native American, which again, very spiritual beings. And, you know, I think about even my grandma, she, she had this, this, this ability. And unfortunately she had actually gone more towards the dark side because honestly the church for the most part hasn't offered the encounter dimension. And I, and I remember even just some books that she had in which I think she actually got freaked out at one point. And then she actually ended up, ended up coming to Christ, which is pretty amazing. But but in that, there, there was definitely an awareness of the realm of the spirit that I say that it just comes through culture, that comes through even just 
who we are as individuals, but also bloodlines. And so I would say that, again, I always had some prophetic dimension as far as I, I can remember in my whole life. But when I got saved, it was like, honestly, like a light switch was turned on and all of a sudden boof, it was like the veil pulled back and I was seeing angels. Angels were showing up in my room at night. I was seeing them during the day. I was seeing demons. I would just, and it was like just everything. I was just aware and in tune with the realm of the spirit. And, uh, and I just, I assumed actually, honestly, Arlene, I, I assumed everybody was like that. So even when Renee is having, I, I said, you see that? There's a demon on that guy's back. And she's like, no, I don't see that at all. And so in that, you begin to see that just, you know, again, part of the giftings and things and graces. And actually, my wife Renee is incredibly prophetic, but, but just a different way. I'm, I'm, I would say I'm more of a, a seer. And I'm sure you've talked with your people, you know, just about the different ways that even how the prophetic can be played out. But I'm more of a seer prophet, I would say, in that I, I see, I'm very much uh, visual and in tune. And I, I see visions, dreams. I mean, and that's really a, one of the main ways that I would say prophetic plays out with even just a, the grace and gifting that I move in in the prophetic yeah. realm. So. But you know what, Stephen, one of the things that I really uh, it, it, um, notice in your story is that you weren't so freaked out when Jesus started to speak to you on the cross. And though, so that suggested already to me that you have been able or have been able even before that to see into yeah. the spiritual dimension, whether you realized that that was exactly what was going on or not you'd already been able to do that. And, and I say a lot of times to people that gifting shows up in the heart of a child. Our, so often our giftings will show up as uh, we are children. And I think you had really the privilege almost of growing up in a family that had a culture that was not strange. Uh, yes. in, in which it wasn't strange for you to see those kind of things because I know some people have really suffered in their backgrounds because uh, their cultures thought, taught that was not something that should have been done and so I, I just think that was God's provision for you too Stephen yeah. but you and Renee also too that's just so loving of the Lord that he was preparing her while he was touching you and meeting you it, to me, that, that is still one of the greatest miracles to me, Arlene, is that, that God would so reach down and, and touch these hearts that were so distant and far from him, and that simultaneous, that he would pull us into this place. Again, I, I think salvation is still, when, when a heart turns to Christ, still the greatest miracle. And we've seen, I mean, so many miracles, Arlene. We've seen people raised from the dead. We've seen, I mean, blind eyes, deaf ears. I mean, even miracles of like eyeballs growing back and new vertebrae growing in place. But again, when, when one hardened soul receives just that soft touch of the Lord, to me, again, it's, just, it's still the greatest miracle. And I just, I just love the Lord for that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hey, Stephen. We're going to talk now a little bit about just your prophetic gifting, because that came online pretty quickly after you asked Christ into your heart. But I know you as one who prophesies in both the church space and also in the different mountains, the, seven, the different seven mountains, and especially media and government. There's really something that you've got there. How did that develop? You know, I, I, and again, I think, you know, part of it is that we, we, we've so made the prophetic so mysterious and it really isn't. And I think that that's part of the grace that God wants to bring because, I mean, we see that Joel clearly prophesies and then Peter reiterates that on the day of Pentecost, in the last day says God, I will pour out my spirit upon everyone and they shall prophesy. So to me, that prophetic grace really should be upon every one of us that calls upon the name of the Lord. Um, and, you know, again, with poor teaching and poor doctrine, we, we've, we've actually steered and diverted actually one of the greatest gifts. I mean, Paul goes on to admonish saying, I wish that you would all would prophesy. I, in fact, he goes, eagerly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you would prophesy. And to me, the part of it, because there's this, there's this building up, there's this edification, exhortation and comfort that comes from that. But, you know, it's like, like, like you were saying, you know, it's just like, we've just lived out the prophetic every day. And it really is just an everyday dimension of the prophetic. I mean, we see, we hear, we listen, and then we obey and then release it. 
You know, and sometimes when we get the re revelation, I, I always, especially with dreams, is that I'll always take those things personally first. So the, the revelation I'm getting, I'm always going, how does this apply to my life? Okay. And, and it, then it's from that place, Arlene, is that then all of a sudden the Lord begins to speak. This is not just about you. This is about maybe a family member, or this maybe this is about that, or maybe this is actually a word actually for the body of Christ. And, and you know, so there's several platforms out there where we're able to get, you know, words out on more of a, a broad scale, you know, via Elijah list and, you know, some of our stuff with the apostolic council and just some other platforms that we're able to actually get, you know, the words out that really would bring encouragement to the whole body of Christ. But it was in that same sense where all of a sudden I'm starting to get dreams of like, key governmental leaders and I'm getting dreams with you know different actors and different people like that in my dreams and so again I began to inquire okay wh what is their role who are they actually in my dream and then you know the Lord because many times my dreams are very literal so what I mean by that is that it's not just a foreshadowing or a parabolic story which I do have that those kind of dreams as well but many times when I dream and I see someone in the dream it really is a dream about them and for them and so God has just opened doors for us many times, both within, you know, the arts and entertainment um, to be able to speak to, to key people within that industry and, and just prophesy and bring the goodness of God in it. And I guess that's the part is that, you know, most of the church has turned their backs on some of those rather prominent uh, domains of society, those spirits of society, in particular government. We've turned our back on government. We've turned our back on Hollywood and arts and entertainment. We've turned our back on the media. And, and then we wonder why the, the wickedness and the evilness is, is all wrapped in all of that. And I believe that we're in a time and a season where we need to begin to speak to those mountains. Grace, grace. <clears throat> and, 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 and part of it, God wants to give us opportunity where we can be a voice like a Daniel and a Joseph, because we see that both with both of them is that they served pagan people, okay? They, 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 their whole point wasn't to get people saved. Their whole point was to bring the reality of the kingdom with the voice and the revelation of the Lord. And I think too often we, we, we want to get everybody saved rather than actually being one who brings good news. Because to me, we know that it's the kindness of God that will even lead someone to repentance. And if we're not even willing to be kind and bring that kind word that actually causes someone to go, oh, and ponder that there really might be a God, then we have no right even speaking to, to people of, of, of influence. And I think that's really some of the correction that needs to take place in this new era that we've stepped in, Arlene. And I think, again, we, we run with circles that get this. Yeah. But the greater body of Christ has to get this in this hour, because if we really want to influence the world, part of it is we have to be in the world to influence. Um, and we've so stepped back and, 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 and are no longer in the world. And what that's created is an irrelevant dimension where the church means nothing. We don't even have a voice anymore. But yeah. all of that literally is we're in a, we're a time and a season of that kind of change where we're going to see the body of Christ come in its fullness and I'll tell you what, even if it's a remnant, let it be a remnant that moves with boldness and kindness that then just causes the world to see that really God is good and he's up to good things all the time. And uh, rather than having that, that representation that just creates and paints a picture of a God who's mostly angry and pointing fingers and is so mad at a lost and dying world when the truth is Jesus came that none should perish. And the whole idea, he didn't come to condemn, he came to save. And I think that that's part of it, that when we become those bearers of good news and we become those hope ambassadors that actually have the prophetic word that brings solution. And that's really what it is. He's looking for, for, for solutionists in this hour. If it's not a word, we're making a word. We're solutionists in this hour that come from prophetic revelation. So, I mean, we've got opportunities, Marlene, where we're, we're speaking to governments. I mean, in and around the, the nations of the earth. And they're coming to us on a regular basis asking, what is God saying? Amen. And to me, you know why shouldn't it be that way? Yeah, and that's exactly where we want to go. It's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. And even as God's prophets and prophetic people, we should be out there and not hold away in a church, but be out there and in the midst of society. So even we've got five more minutes for this interview. And I'm going to ask you now, what, in your opinion, 
is the most important thing that the Lord is trying to say to the church, the body of Christ worldwide right now? Well, we, we really are in a new season and we can say that every season, but, but we literally are in a new season where there, there is a sound of the spirit is, but that has been released. And part of that sound is actually an awakening. There are, there are awakening angels that have been released, but with that, the lion of the tribe of Judah is roaring. And part of why he's roaring is he's releasing these vibrations of awakening, these vibrations of love. And it's our time and our season to begin to receive those vibrations that bring awakening, because I'll tell you what, he's gonna visit his bride because he's coming to his bride first and foremost to bring awakening so that we become really the answer to many people's prayers those that don't know him yet. And I would say that, that we, are, we are definitely in a season of shaking. We know that actually from Haggai chapter two, that, that he's gonna shake everything that can be shaken. And in the midst of the shakings, the whole reason he's doing it is he wants to draw his church. He wants to draw the nations to the desire nation, Jesus himself. And I, I think that, that when we embrace Christ in the midst of the shakings and we find that sure footing upon him, and that's part of it, is that we need to find our sure footing upon the rock of our salvation, Jesus Christ. And, and we really are in a season where Isaiah 61 and Isaiah 60 and Isaiah 61 are about to become such a reality where it's a time to arise and shine for our light has come. And this reality that, that the glory is on us, never mind the darkness. We too often folk on the, focus on the darkness when we see things that are going bad. We need to focus on the glory that's on us. And when we do, guess what? That's when the Gentiles will come. That's when kings will run to the brightness of our rising. But with it too, that we know that part of it is we're carrying that torch of Isaiah 61, where Jesus said, the Lord God has anointed me. He's anointing his people in this hour. Because what happens that in the midst of the anointing in the first part of Isaiah 61 is it brings restoration to individual people. It, it, I mean, there, there's beauty for ashes. There's, 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 there's joy for mourning. There's, there's, there's the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness so that we can be the display of him, that glorious display, so that the next part can happen. And it's about restoring ancient ruins. It's about restoring cities. It's about restoring nations. And that's what God is calling his people to attention in this hour. And that's why we need to take the serious dimension of what God is inviting us into, because we are part of the remedy. He's looking for a people that will carry his anointing and grace. And that's what he's saying to the church in this hour. He who has ear, let him hear what the spirit is saying to the churches. It's time to arise and shine and, and be quick. There's a quickening he wants to bring as well. And so I just want to bless the church right now. I bless the church right now with this reality that the greatest days are yet to come and that you were called to arise and shine to be the radiance of Christ in all of his splendor and glory. And I decree and declare that he's not coming quickly, except he's coming quickly in and through you so that the whole earth can be filled with his glory. And I just bless you with that reality that as you receive his anointing, that as you are once again restored and you can begin to restore individuals, but the whole goal is so that nations can be saved, so that nations can be discipled, so that the kindness and grace and goodness of the father can go forth for such a time as this. So I bless you with that in Jesus name. Hallelujah. Stephen, thank you so much. Stephen, if people want to get in touch with you or find out more about your ministry, where can they go online? Yes, you can go to uh, www.globalpresence.com is our website. There you can get tapped in and sign up for our email. Uh, we've got Prophetic Pulse, which is uh, one of our uh, ways of just re receiving and releasing uh, prophetic words. You can also find us on social media, uh, Stephen Springer. Facebook, uh, Stephen J. Springer on Instagram and, and others as well. Um, but yeah, you, you can, you can, you'll find us. Just, just search and you'll find us. So yeah, All right. thanks, Arlena. I really appreciate just, just being part of this too because I, what, what you're doing in this hour uh, is, is what needs to be done because it's, it's part of the awakening, it's part of the reformation that God's bringing even in and through Europe for such a time as this. Hallelujah. Stephen, thank you so much. I could just feel the spirit of the Lord as you were releasing that impartation and speaking. Stephen, God bless you. God bless Renee, your wife, you. and also your family. And uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Now you see what I mean. There was life flowing through that video. The Holy Spirit was all over it. And I love Stephen's perspective about it's the love of God and the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. You know what? 
I'm just going to ask you just to take a moment just to share this video with those you know. I'll be interviewing also other prophets and other apostles on this series, especially this one. Share this video and also take a moment to like it. If you haven't already done so, then subscribe to my YouTube channel and click on the bell signal so you can be notified when I post a new video either for myself or in this new series, Prophetic Perspectives, Vital Revelation for the Church at this time.